Channel C News. In tonight's leading story, a group of students have encountered functions, both recursive and iterative. On meeting a group of monks outside the towers of Hanoi, they successfully solved the problem using a recursive method and analyzed its runtime. In our other story tonight, the students also began preparing for their midterm that was due to begin in Thursday in just two weeks' time. We hope that our students will be well prepared and wish them the best of luck. From all of us at Channel C News, good night and good luck. All of you are now unfortunately aware of the impending doom of your mid-semester test, which is not this Thursday, but Thursday coming. More details on that will be released soon, both on the class webpage on Ed, and I will revisit those for you uh, when we have more details on exactly how they're going to be performed. For today's content, you'll notice that I am again making a bit of change of costume. Today I've got this nice rainbow tie here instead of my banana badge and shirt from last week or my bow ties from the week before. Why is this? Today is LGBT day for our class. We're going to be looking at one of the absolute heroes of computer science. This is of course Alan Matheson Turing, known as the father of computer science, breaker of the Enigma code, and the creator of both the Turing test and the Turing machine. The Turing machine, which is an abstract representation of how computers function. If you want to learn more about this incredible figure from computer science history, I highly, highly encourage all of you to go and read a bit more of his story. But a few highlights. He was born in 1912 and died in 90, 1954 at just age 41. Why is this? Well, Alan Turing was well known to be a gay man, and at the time in England, this was against the law. So after his, uh, his seminal work, Breaking the Enigma Machine, and his great services to the United Kingdom, Alan Turing was chemically castrated by the British government and eventually died at age 41 of cyanide poisoning, which is believed to have been a suicide. Um, in 2013, he was pardoned by Queen Elizabeth II uh, many, many years too late and now appears on the 50 pound note in the United Kingdom. So a very, very important figure in computer science history and also the man after whom the greatest prize in computer science is named, the Turing Award, which with it comes, a, comes $1 million in prize money. Turing was instrumental both in the development of practical computing, but also in the development of the theory of computing. So what we're learning in this class, along with our ability to write simple programs, which was an artifact of Turing's development of digital programmable computers, accompanies our kind of formal analysis and our mathematical analysis, which was actually Turing's larger body and more influential body of work. We also have a second figure that I wanted to highlight today because our content for this week focuses on computers' memory and organization. This, of course, is Lynn Conway, probably the greatest transgender activist and figure in computer science history. She was responsible for the envisioning and the design of the world's first very large-scale integrated chip designs. And this sounds like a whole mouthful of words, but what it actually means is that instead of having small parts of the processor divided up in lots of different places along the body of the computing board, so say you have a motherboard, instead of laying out all your chips in far different areas and each of them do something different, her idea was to mesh them all into a very tightly packed design that could be manufactured at small scales in a foundry. A foundry is a place where you make silicon chips. As a result, we, came, we had the ability to design many of the chips that we use today. Most notably, I'd actually say, would be the Apple M1 chips, which are the hallmark of this design feature where we're packing a lot of different units into a single chip. So for any of you who have a 2020 or later MacBook, the chips that you were using were very heavily influenced by Lynn Conway's ideas. This is what one of the chips might look like at a 200 micrometer scale. You can see here a whole lot of different repeating units packed into very small space. This is also representative of a computer's memory, which we can think of abstractly as a series of boxes located in different places inside the computer. When we consider how the memory of a computer is organized, 
The easiest way to think of it, which is the way our operating system thinks of it, is like a long chain of repeating blocks. And each block has an address, which we will get to with our trusty mailbox shortly over here. So the simplest way we can think of this is as a series of independent boxes starting at address zero, because we're computer science scientists. We always start counting at zero. And so I need one volunteer from the audience who is happy to stand for a little, who is going to be our location zero. So Albert is going to be our trusty location zero for the minute. And he is also going to hold up for us an ampersand. For those of you on Zoom, Oh, other way around, there we go. An ampersand. An ampersand is the symbol that we're going to use to represent the address of something. So what is the address of Albert's location? Shout it out from the crowd. Zero. zero. That's right. So anytime we want to get the number zero out of Albert, who's going to give him a, we'll give him a microphone. Where do the roaming mics go? Have you got enough hands? So anytime the audience asks you for your address, you're going to tell them what it is. And that should be on now. Test. There we go. OK. Albert, what's your address? Zero. Great. So the, our operating system is going to tell programs which places they are able to write things into and which places are forbidden. Now, computers' memories are very large. Obviously, you want to be able to store our glorious lectures in 4K ultra-high definition with surround sound audio. So we're going to need a few more mailboxes than just that one over there. But we'll get to that shortly. If you write to a place that doesn't exist in the computer, say you've gone all the way over there and the mailboxes only go up to here, if you try and access something over there, uh, you will get what we call in computer science a segfault. We'll cover why it's called a segfault in just a few moments. But for now, know that this is an error that the operating system gives your program when it's done something very wrong, when it's tried to touch memory that it's not allowed to touch or that simply just doesn't exist. Now, what do I mean by not allowed to touch? Well, obviously, there are different programs in our computer's memory, and we don't want all the programs to be able to touch each other's stuff. Like, one way you could think of it is that each of the programs is like a separate different user. We don't want them to be able to mess with each other's variables without explicit and very sophisticated prior permission. Modern operating systems, however, don't let you use address zero. Uh, zero is a reserved address. We're going to call this the null pointer. Um, and so, Albert, I request that if you move over one space, And what address are we at now? One. Very good. Address one. OK, you're going to be standing there a while, potentially the whole lecture. So this is what the computer's uh, memory looks like from the very beginning. This is what we're going to call virtual memory. Don't worry about why that is for the minute. But just know that every program in your computer gets to see a copy of the entire space of possible addresses. But inside, the computer does some trickery to make sure that these virtual addresses all point to a different space inside the actual physical chip. So every computer, every program in the computer gets to think it has access to everything. And the operating system figures out a mapping between these addresses here and the actual places inside the computer's memory. When you allocate a variable, when you declare a variable in your program, it's going to be placed in this special area called the stack. Now, the, you'll notice that the stack is currently of limited size. And every time you add a variable, we're going to allow the stack to grow. And the stack is going to grow downwards. So over here, we have Albert at address 1 in this little blank space here. But our stack is going to start on this side over here, if we imagine that this is the, the biggest side of the computer's memory up the very top. Above the stack, we've got this space, the OS kernel space. So that's a, a section of the memory reserved for your operating system and is very highly protected. After that, we have the stack where your program's variables are. Then we have some blank space, some blank space, the heap, BSS, data, text, and then we're off the end back at address zero. And we'll go through some of these other areas now. The text segment of memory is where the actual instructions of your program live. When you compile your program, 
the program gets converted into some binary data, some gobbledygook that we can open up and look at, look at and I've shown you in lecture before. But when you run your program, the computer actually needs those instructions available to it. It needs to feed them into the CPU. So what does it do? It copies them off the hard drive where you've put them in your nice file and puts them round about where Albert is standing. So Albert would represent the program, the program instructions that you've written, and then at the other end are going to be the variables that you've constructed. A segmentation fault refers to these segments of memory, these different blocks. Some of the segments are marked as your program is allowed to write data to them. For example, your program is allowed to put things in the heap. That's part of your program's usable memory. But if we try to write something to the operating system space up there in the kernel, we're going to get a segmentation fault. These will be the bane of your existence when programming for the next few weeks, but they're a good indication that you've made some kind of mistake in your program with regards to memory or with regards to figuring out where different things are located. So returning to our nice little boxes, and I wanna make a special thank you to Jisoo Jian who helped me with the construction of our beautiful mailbox here at the Telstra Creator Space. We're going to explore how our variables are actually laid out. So let's say we have a string. We'll get to exactly how strings function in C probably in a week or two, but for now, let's take it as a given that it's a series of characters with a null byte at the end, with a zero at the end, and we'll cover this soon. Our string for today is going to be hello with a new line at the end and a zero. You'll notice that each of these takes up eight bytes, a byte being the smallest addressable unit of memory in most modern computers. What I mean by addressable is that if you try and ask for the address of something smaller than a byte, the computer doesn't have those. The smallest box it has fits a byte in it. So we have uh, hello in there, um, and each of them take up, sorry, eight bits, and eight bits makes up one byte, which is one box. However, you can't actually access the individual bit address, addresses. So if I ask for a 0x2, these are written in hexadecimal, or base 16, it's gonna throw me an error. So I'm gonna go in the size, the minimum size of a box, which is a byte. One byte is eight bits, so for each box that we go along, we, go, we add eight to the previous address. Now you'll notice that 10 doesn't look like eight plus eight, but this is because we're operating in base 16. So after we hit nine, we go A, B, C, D, E, F, and then we get to zero. You can imagine it that instead of having digits one to nine and zero marking the start of it, we have digits one to nine and then A, B, C, D, E, F. And so in that column, just like you do in grade school math, when you're figuring out, okay, if I add 13 and two, well, the three and the two are in the ones place, and three and two, if I count up two more of my digits that I have, that get me to five. Hexadecimal works a similar way. You line up the places and you add the number of symbols ahead that you have available. Why don't we use bits for this? This seems a little confusing. I mean, even I screwed it up when I was telling you about it the first time. Why don't we just use bits for our addresses? Why use this kind of complicated structure? Well. The very, very first computers, like the ones that Alan Turing was working on, did use bits. But if you, if you use uh, characters a lot and you use large types a lot, it might be more convenient or easier to use a larger basic type for the computer. And it turns out when programming in, in ordinary life, we, we rarely use bits. I mean, they do show up in some places, like cryptography, which I study. But for the most part, we're only dealing with characters and things larger. So as historical accident, once people were using characters frequently, they designed computers to suit that, and it just stuck. So now we are all stuck with this system, but it's not too bad, you'll get used to it soon. Now remember that each of the characters that we're using is an ASCII character, so they're a number as well. And they're a number between zero and 255. Zero and 255, why? This is going back to our very first week, and I need another roaming microphone, Liam. Why do we go between zero and 255? Okay, you've answered me a bunch. Henny, do you wanna answer this one? Nah. Okay, you guys. 
Remind me your names. D. 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 Because, because two to the power of eight is two, six, 256. Exactly, so if two to the uh, power of eight is 256, and we have eight different bits that we can flip in between zero, uh, zero x zero and zero x eight, the, this gives us a maximum of 256 different things we can put in them. And remember that zero is a thing, so that gives us only the numbers zero to 255. So those are our ASCII bytes in there. So just like in our prior diagram of the different segments in a computer's memory, one way to think about this and that's commonly depicted is to put it vertically. So for some of the following diagrams, we're gonna put this vertically, it represents the same thing. Now, of course, computers don't actually have an up or a down inside their memory, so you could just as easily put the high addresses at the top or the high addresses at the bottom. In our prior diagram, we had the high addresses at the top. In this one, we have them at the bottom. This is gonna become important when we learn how the stack we are finally getting to the very exciting part of today's plot and the reason why Albert here is saving our mailbox. Today we are introducing pointers. Pointers are a way for your computer to manipulate memory and to refer specifically to some of these addresses. So let's do this a bit more concretely than the slides. So here I'm going to be using a program called Kling. Don't worry about it, but this is a special program that I've got set up on my computer to allow us to type in C statements bits of a C program and see what happens if I just run those statements. So now I am going to need two extra volunteers. What was your name again? Don't worry, you don't have to do that much. Your name. Oh, uh, Bo Xiao. Bo Xiao. Okay, down the front. And someone else? Oh, Juan. 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 Okay, both of you down the front. H-O-A-N. Yeah. Oh, Juan. Okay. So you've got the number 255 in your box. So cross that out and write 255. There we go. We can ignore the, the JU. Now we're gonna create two more variables. So I need two more folks from the audience. Xinjiang, you've, you've been involved a lot. Okay, fine, you can come, come up this time. And one, one other person who I haven't seen a bunch. Tanner Khan, do you wanna come down? I know you're not even in the class, but you're welcome. Okay. Now, you two are going to be called X and Y, and I will make special variable types for you. Okay, Xinjiang, you're X, and Tanakan, you're Y. Now, one thing that I've done here, and where did I put my other, oh, here it is, is I have the special, once I get it out of my pocket, The special star of dereferencing. This is our little star here. You can see it's got FOA written over there. And I can send anyone who wants a design to make your own special star of dereferencing. And with it comes the dereferencing dance, which we're going to do a bunch of times in our, in our activity. And you'll notice that our two beautiful pointers over here, our variable types, have the star of dereferencing outside their name to remind us that these are pointers. And our pointers are going to do the all-important job of pointing to things. And Albert, don't worry, you're, you're, not, uh, you're not safe from this one. Um, you, you will be used very shortly. So, let's start using our pointers. Uh, Albert, if you want to move up and choose one of the variables, and you're gonna be their storage, and they can it can be the storage for Juan's. Okay, yep. Yep, exactly. So this is a memory address, and we are gonna put uh, Juan's 255 inside the mailbox. Oh, where's the second mic? Here we are. Okay, Albert, has your address changed? Well, you moved up a little, but is your address the same as the thing inside the box? No. Exactly. These are two separate concepts. Opening the box and figuring out what's inside and looking at the address on the mailbox are two very different things. And this is the key point of confusion in pointers that by doing this demo, I'm hoping to make a little clearer for you. We're going to use our special star of addressing to Albert, what's your address? You can figure it out. You moved up three spaces, so. One plus three. 
Okay, so we'll, we'll say, yeah, we'll say we're at address three. Um, and that's what we do using our ampersand over here. And if we open, if we want to open the box, we use our star of dereferencing, right? So Juan, if you want to figure out, if you want to remember what number you stored in Albert's address, what do you use? Star. Yeah, the star of dereferencing. So let's apply the star to the box and open it up and we can pull out our 255 again. So let's do this with our C program. Um, I'm going, I need one more volunteer. One more volunteer, who's gonna, Henny, you can use the star of dereferencing when we get to it. Okay, and my X and Y, don't worry, I haven't forgotten you, we're getting there. Okay, so X equals address of Borsiao. What do you think that does? Uh, Xinjiang, where did the microphone go, the second one? Xinjiang, so I just set you to be the address of Bosial. So where do you think you go? Where are you gonna stand? So I'm just standing here, but yeah. my value, like the value I have would be three. So can you point to Bosial? Yep, so now we've got, maybe, maybe move back, move back that way, and now Xinjiang can point at it, point it you clearly. You're pointing at Bosial. Yeah, he, he, that guy over there. Yeah, right. So we'll, we see that Xinjiang hasn't act, Xinjiang hasn't actually moved. But what we've done is we've taken the address of where's my lovely ampersand. We've taken the address of Bosial, who's standing over here, and we've given the address over to Xinjiang. So Xinjiang is now holding the location in his memory of where Bosial is. We've got some more operations to do. This is hopefully gonna get clearer as we go through them. Our next operation is Y, and this is Tanakan, is the address of, uh, of Juan. It didn't work, and there is a very good reason for this. This was expected. Why might it not have worked? I need some, someone else from the audience. Henny, we'll use you in a minute. So getting close, what type, hold that for a second. What type is uh, Juan? Uh, an integer. He's an integer. And what type is, uh, is Tanakan standing over there who is Y? Uh, a character. He's a character pointer, which means he points to a? Character. Uh, exactly. So our, uh, our C compiler is complaining that we have tried to get Tanakan to point at an integer um, he tried, we've tried to get him to point at a character, but he's an integer pointer. He's only able to point to integers. So we can do something to fix this up. We're going to use a cast. Remember this from our, I think our first or our second week, we had a way of converting the type of something such that the compiler would allow us to violate its normal rules. So we are going to disguise Juan as an, as an, we're going to disguise him as a character, um, which would be to write that. But because we're getting his address, we want to disguise him as the address of a character. And so now if we do that, and I ask the, what Y is, Y is that character, which is 255, which is equivalent to FF if we're talking about uh, bytes. 255 is FF in hexadecimal. So everyone, go line, line up Juan, you have to maybe go in front, and Boshial, go a bit back, and do your Tanakan. Now you know where you're pointing at Juan, so you're pointing at front. Yeah, you're just pointing at him. You're still, your address is still the same, but you're pointing in that direction. Okay. Let's do a few more fancy things and see how stuff changes. And this is where it starts to get really interesting. Henny, you're needed. Okay, get up. And everyone, you guys have to stay where you were before. Henny, so who is Y? That's Tanakan over here. And the special star of dereferencing 
says, go to the thing that Tanakan is pointing to, that's our star of D referencing, go to the thing that he's pointing to, right? And set it equal to the value of the thing he's pointing to, plus one. So Juan, you need your, need your piece of paper. Need your piece of paper, yep. Dereference it using the star of dereferencing, open it up and add one to it, and then we're putting it back inside the same box. How do we know we're putting it inside the same box? Because Henny over here is pointing his special star of dereferencing at the same box that is pointed to by Tanakan. Here we go. So I'll let you two fix that up and we'll run that line. Now we can also do this operation like that. And now we've got overflow back to the other side because we've gotten to 255. We've added one, so that takes us to zero because we've, we only have room for 255 things, so we've reset. And now we've added one more, so we're back onto one. So you'll notice I've, I've added one twice. Now things get even more complicated and a little hairier. So let's do it to X first. So Henny, this is gonna need you and your magic power, your magic dereferencing star. So we dereference B and we add one to what it was. And remember characters are just the same as numbers because we're using ASCII and so boss y'all, you've got your A, change it to a B. And the way this is done is, uh, is Henny follows what Xinjiang is pointing to. Close enough. So Henny's action was to go and look at what Xinjiang is pointing to, use his magic star of dereferencing, and follow all the way over, and we have our magic. What does this one do? Okay, people at the front. So Tanakan and Xinjiang, you need to, keep your, need to keep your hands up for this. This is something that you two do. So which one of you is Y? Tanakan, right? And we're saying Y equals X. So what is X doing? Where's he pointing? He's pointing over there. So now both of them are pointing in the same direction and no one is pointing to poor Juan. So now we're both pointing over there, okay. Now, Henny, come over here. You're gonna. Now we're going to use our dereferencing star on Tanakan on Y. So use your dereferencing. Where's he pointing? He's pointing over there. Yep. And Juan, what do you do? Plus equals one. Yep. So make that a C. Okay, Henny, this one's for you again. I just wanna know what star X is. So what is star X? Do the dereference dance. Uh, whoops, that'll print out the value. And it's still C. You can see that both Tanakan and Xinjiang are now pointing at the same thing. And so when we make a change to one of them, both of them are affected because neither of them are actually storing the value. In fact, there is another copy of Albert still standing over here with his letterbox in which C is contained. And maybe for next year, we'll have two mailboxes to make this a little easier. Okay, I need one last volunteer. Yara, you're standing close to the, uh, you're sitting close to the front, so you're, you're up. Now, this is kind of a special one. This is doubly complicated. What, what type do you think you are. I'm a pointer that points to a character pointer. Exactly. So remember, adding the star means the thing that comes after is what we're pointing at. So we're pointing at a character star, which means it's a pointer to a pointer. So which of these people on the stage are you allowed to point to? Uh, characters. Are you? Are you a pointer to a character? No, but character pointer to X and Y. Yeah, so these are the only two people on stage to whom she's allowed to point because she is a pointer to a pointer. 
So now let's actually set you to something. And remember, Xinjiang was X, Tanakan was Y. So where are you pointing now? You're pointing to Tanakan. Tanakan, where are you pointing? Over there. And let's, Henny, this is your moment again. Yep, that, that's the statement. Oh, whoops, sorry. Where do we go? Nope, stop, you've gone too far. Yeah, no, no, no. This is an important question. Why did we go too far? What was wrong with that? Because she's only pointing to a pointer. Exactly. Yara is pointing to a pointer. She's not actually herself pointing all the way there. So when we use our magic star of dereferencing, we only go one step. We would need to use two stars if we wanted to go all the way. So let's see what is inside Yara. Oh, that. There we go. Uh, the reason, ignore the fact that it printed out the C anyway, that's a, a trick of what's going on. But we need the two stars to go all the way to that character. So we'll do the two stars now, go from the start, dereference once, dereference twice, and we're there. OK, now we're going to do something pretty terrible. Um, we are going to set. So Xinjiang? Point at zero. Where is zero? It's nowhere. You're done. OK, you can go back. You can grab a chocolate from Liam on the way out. Tanakan, you're still pointing? Not pointing anymore? You're gone. Um, you can just leave it here. OK, Yara, what are you doing now? Uh, I need the, where's the, where do I put that microphone? Second one. Thanks, Henny. I'm pointing at the void, no. We are still, you're not pointing at null. Remember, you're a pointer to a pointer. So you are actually still pointing at Tanakan. Even though Tanakan is now empty himself, you're still pointing at Tanakan. So Henny, I want you to come over here, because we are going to dereference Yara again. OK, so we've dereferenced Yara. Yep. We go to Tanakan, and that's fine, because Tanakan's just a location. What would happen if I did this? It's null. And what happens if we uh, try and dereference a null pointer? It's a location that we don't have permission to access. Albert, what do we do? Seg fault, exactly. A segmentation fault, the program crashes. I'm not sure if it'll crash in this instance. Yeah, it doesn't crash because I'm running this special programming environment. But you can take my word for it that if you try and do this ordinarily, your program will crash. And with that, thank you to Bosyal, Juan, Albert, Yara, and Henny. All of you can grab a chocolate and go sit down, and we'll get to the rest of our lecture. The key concepts that we explored using this demo around the front is that the contents of an address can itself be an address. So just as we had Xinjiang and Juan containing other people's addresses, pointing to them, those addresses themselves are just numbers. So if we asked Xinjiang, what, do you, what number do you contain within yourself, he would have given us an example. So uh, let's say that Xinjiang is top. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5, 0, and we prefix it with all those zeros just to, because our computer's memory is large, so we save enough digits for all the places in the computer's memory. And then hit contain at the end, at, at the far side of him, he'd have the value 5, 0. And of course, 5, 0 is just another place in our computer's memory. So he could point to the uh, actual number 10. So it'd be pointing to an address 5, 0. And over here, 5, 0 would be holding up the number 10. And so in, at all times, what we're playing with is just numbers. But we can use our numbers to represent both just numbers that we're doing arithmetic with, but also pointers. Likewise, you can also imagine doing arithmetic with pointers. Let's say we take uh, Xinjiang's pointer, which ends in 5, 0, and we add 8 to it. Now, I need my roaming microphone again, and I want someone else to tell me what would happen if I add eight, added 8 to that. And one of you guys. What was your name again? Um, Angel. Angel. Oh, yeah. 
So what would we get if I added eight to the pointer? The pointer is that pink bit at the very top. So it's a number that ends in five zero, so let's just call that 50 for the minute, just for example's sake. What's 50 plus eight? 58 in hex. And where is 58 in our chart? What is at 58? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, say that into the microphone again. Yeah. yeah. So what we can do here is pointer arithmetic. We don't just have to, we, pointers are more flexible than just things that we can set to one variable or another. We can use pointers to explore different parts of the computer's memory. Likewise, if we go back 10 from, uh, if we go back eight from 50, we'd get to the prior address, which uh, in our demo here contains 111. Notice the difference between the pointer at the top, which we're treating as a block of four, and the integer or the, the character over there that contains the number 10. The reason we're able to treat the four blocks up the top as a contiguous whole, as meaning one thing together, as meaning an address, is because of C's type system. So when you tell C that you want to use a pointer, C has an inbuilt, the compiler knows ahead of time how many bytes it needs in order to refer to an address. On a 32-bit computer, this would be four bytes. What about on a 60-bit, 64-bit computer? How many boxes would we need? So if that's 32 and we need four, how many would we need for 64? Take a guess. Uh, two. So is 64 bigger or smaller than 32? It should, it should be back. So, uh, so double. Right. Exactly. It's double because we need extra bits for every bit in the uh, increased size of the address space. So if we were on a 64-bit computer, instead of our address type being, instead of our pointer type just being four of these, our address would actually be all of those, and this would be referring to address 0000000, 50, 111, 10, 0. That would all be part of one address. And so the size of the pointers also matters, but the compiler handles that for you invisibly. Trixie, eh? Okay, we've already done some of this. So at the end of the day, the way we know whether a variable is a number or is actually an address is just by C's type system. By setting something's type, we allow our program to choose how to interpret what is located at any given segment of, at any given address in memory. And remember, at an address, there can be, the lo there can be another address, or at an address, there can be an integer or a character or any of our other C types. And the way that our compiler knows when we talk about pointers, whether we want the address, let's say it's a pointer, and if we want to get the, if we want to know what the address is, and we're talking about a pointer, we just ask for the value of that variable. However, if we want to know what the pointer points to, then we use our magic star of dereferencing. So if you just use a pointer's name, Without the special star of the referencing, also this is not a C term, this is a me term, the, the special star of the referencing. Um, if you just use a variable's name without the star, what, and you print it, you'll just get the actual number of the address. If you wanna find out what's at the address, use the star. So this was what our star did. And on the other hand, our ampersand was used in a slightly different context. This was used if we have the value of something, but want to go backwards and figure out the number of the mailbox. So this was every time we asked Albert, Albert, where are you standing? This is the symbol you use to tell the C compiler that you want to get that answer out of the variable. So these two symbols, if you think back to this demo, every time you're playing with pointers, hopefully it'll be a little bit clearer. Magic star of dereferencing tells you what's at, an, at a location in memory if you already have the location. And the ampersand tells you the location if you've already got the variable go through these, other than to note that, I'm not sure this animation will work. The thing here to note is going back to our picture of memory, is that the stack grows down when we add variables, so we can keep going down and down and down. 
But next week, we're also going to learn how to, about how to put things on the heap. And the heap grows up. So if the stack grows down and the heap grows up, why might we have a problem? If the heap and the stack take up the same uh, addresses. Exactly. So each of these places are referring to different addresses in the computer. And if the two of them collide, we've run out of space. And either what will happen is we'll overwrite some of the things that we meant to store. Or hopefully, the program will throw an error indicating that we've run out of space. So this is why we moved from 32-bit to 64-bit. Because if you're operating in a 32-bit world, you've got less space between them. In fact, you have less space in this diagram overall. So in order to maximize the amount of space that we have, we add more zeros to these addresses over here, which gives us more space. And the way we did that, we were representing that physically, is we had Albert over here uh, representing our text segment. And we had um, Xinjiang over there representing a variable on our stack. Um, and all moving to 64 bits was, is doing is it's putting Xinjiang far, far over there beyond the wall. So it gives us a lot more space for our heap to grow because our heap grows from this side that way and our stack grows from this side and goes that way. And with that, I think we are good for today. We have two minutes left for questions before moving on to some demos of all of these principles next week. Uh, tomorrow, sorry, yes. Thanks, Liam. <laughs>